This may not seem like one of the biggest years for iPhone upgrades, but the changes that are there will have some massive upgrades in our day-to-day -day lives and the way that we use our phones. The regular 15 series is inheriting some of the best features of the Pros. And meanwhile, the 15 Pro is pulling further and further away with some of its lens choices. So let's figure out what's happening from a photography and filmmaking perspective. It's not surprising that we have a few more colors to choose from. The design has been slightly refined, but no revolution here. Probably the biggest exterior change and the thing that'll affect us all is switching from lightning to USB-C. Now, I've got some complaints about how they're doing this, but I've already seen a bit of a backlash on Twitter about needing to replace all your ports, which that reaction doesn't make any sense to me because everything uses USB-C now. You can travel with just one cable. This is absolutely a huge gain for everybody. I'm very excited for it. The thing that I wish Apple hadn't done is that on the iPhone 15, it's still USB 2, which is a very old standard and pretty slow. So you're only getting the huge speed upgrades and benefits if you're getting the iPhone 15 Pro. It really seems like all the models should have had these faster data rates. But very good news, something I've personally been waiting for, AirPods Pro will now be compatible with USB-C. I mean, th this is the thing, you can change everything over to this one cable, it's, it's great news. The 15 also gets the little dynamic island that we saw in the 14 Pro, which after I've been using it for a year is pretty fun, but you kind of forget that it's there, which is the sign of good interface design. When apps integrate it well, it becomes very powerful. I think my favorite use case still is tracking your current flight information. I use Flighty for that. And the processor is the A16 Bionic, same as we had in the 14 Pro. So again, they're splitting those newer processors to the new Pro models. But let's skip some of the smaller details and get to the camera. Now, all the iPhones have 48 megapixel sensors, but what's interesting is that even though they share that 48 megapixel number, they don't seem to be the same camera. The sensor looks like it's a little bit larger on the 15 Pro, and the regular models have a 26 millimeter lens versus a 24 millimeter lens on the Pro, and that's also why you're seeing a slightly different aperture because it's the ratio of that sensor size to the focal length that creates the aperture number. But I wanna know, like, is there an important quality difference or do they basically come out looking the same? Either way, Apple clearly feels confident in these sensors because they're bumping the output megapixels from 12 to 24. This has not happened in a long time. Apple sticks to 12 because it looks good. And if the sensor size doesn't grow, you often don't really get a quality improvement just by raising the output of megapixels. You have to have the quality in that little sensor. So I really wanna see, do the 24 megapixel files actually look better? It's not necessarily guaranteed, but the samples Apple showed, they look great. So we'll find out once we can really zoom in on them. They're saying the 15 also now has two times zoom, which is a great feature, but it's also kind of confusing, maybe misleading to call it zoom because it is just cropping into the sensor. So in effect, it's still a digital zoom, but it looks very good because we've had this on the 14 Pro. And I find if you're gonna be using the image in a digital context, like Instagram stories, for example, that two times looks great. But if you try to zoom in at all, it does fall apart. It's not the same as the uncropped image. So don't really think of it completely as a zoom. Think about it like an extra high quality crop that works really well. It's become a bit of a ritual on this channel. Every year I see what's new on the iPhone and then I see the innovations that Casetify has been working on. And they sent me this giant package of their latest iPhone 15 cases. This is the Ultra Bounce. First they had their Impact, then Ultra Impact, and then last year the Bounce case this is Ultra Bounce. So let's go through everything that's new here. First of all, these corners are insane. It's like squeezing a sneaker. It's the most reinforced rubber I've ever seen on an iPhone case. But I need to be clear, this isn't just rubber. I've tested this EcoShock absorbent material before and conveniently, I think they've included another sample this year. This stuff is legit. It is so shock absorbing and just takes all the energy when your phone drops. I'll show you in a minute. And these chunky corners give us 32.8 feet of drop protection. And actually couldn't see it at first, but there's camera protectors built in. You don't need to add an extra piece for that. They are just never exposed to anything that could ever scratch them. So you know they're safe forever. If we take a look at this one, you can see that they have MagSafe built in. This does have to be in your case as well. Even if the phone supports it, the case has to also support it so the magnetic power can pass through. Plus the Ultra Bounce has this X pattern across the back, which also helps absorb shock. 
from every angle, no matter how you end up dropping it. And here they've also included their neck strap slash camera strap, which is actually compatible with anything. It just like slots in there. You can take it on and off. It doesn't block your charging port. And then you've got a secure strap to keep your iPhone around your neck. It's one thing to tell you about EcoShock, which is made from recycled old iPhone cases using their Recasetify program, but it's another to show you. Let's take this unboxing one step further and do some tests. So on the left, we have Casetify's EcoShock, and on the right, we've got generic competitor rubber that you'll find in all the other cases. Okay, these balls are heavy. I hope I don't break anything. That's got some serious bounce. So basically a trampoline over here. Now let's try the EcoShock. I did try this test last year, and the first thing I checked was if these were magnetic or something, because like, look at it. It just doesn't even roll off. And it's not, it's not, there's no trick. Like it takes all of the force and absorbs it. Whereas the competitor just, just vibrates forever. So check out the link in the description below, get a special discount. And thanks again to Casetify for sponsoring this video. But that was an easy test. Nothing was gonna break. So stick around to the end of the video to see a real drop test. One update that probably seems small, but I think will really affect how everybody works on their photography is that portrait mode is now a bit more automated and smart of a feature. So it will automatically be able to turn on if it detects the right type of subject. And it's also been improved so that the cutout should be better. I wanna wait and see. I'm always hoping that gets really good because it's almost there every year, but there's still always small artifacts I can see. But the great news is that now you can turn it on after the fact without choosing portrait mode. So I think this will affect things because a lot of people will just end up with portrait mode on without even realizing it. You know what, that bokeh in the background does look really good. The way that Apple generates that blur, including foreground objects that are closer to the camera being blurrier, I mean, it's very realistic. So average users that don't usually think about this, will end up with it in more of their features. And you know what, I think they're really gonna like the way it looks. Apple also mentioned that now it works on pets. I thought it kind of already worked well on pets, so maybe it'll work even better now. Another feature they went over really quickly is smooth zoom for videos. I'm not sure how this works in the interface, but I love this idea. I mean, especially if it's a digital zoom, the camera can just gradually pull out without seeing the human intervention. I wanna see how this works because it's actually a really nice effect. There's no real updates to the selfie camera or the ultra wide, which I think both of those need more attention because they are used so often. I love the ultra wide. It's kind of my favorite lens sometimes. The way they do HDR processing has also been updated. Now they're up to version five. They didn't talk about any of the details here, but looking at the samples, both on the 15 and 15 Pro, it looks like there might be some subtle changes that make a big difference to my eye. I keep coming back to this image, which was a sample from the Pro using portrait mode. And what I'm impressed by is how deep the shadows are. Often a problem of getting exposure on more subtle images like this is that the shadows tend to lift up and you get a strong HDR effect. If you ever used larger sensor cameras like a mirrorless, you'll know those shadows usually stay dark and it can look a little artificial when phones lift them up too much. And it just feels very smooth and natural here. And also this example just has really great contrast ratios. I find that studio lit images are weirdly harder to make work on the iPhone. It likes just natural light where everything is lit equally. So maybe we're seeing a bit of a change in how it's dealing with images. I hope this reflects everyday shooting situations. But if you're really into cameras and you love photo and video, you've probably got your eye on the 15 Pro because that's where the biggest, most interesting changes are. Now it's gonna be made out of titanium, a similar brushed metal to what we saw on the Apple Watch Ultra and it looks really great on there. It also reminds me of older MacBook Pros. And even though most of us keep our phones in cases, we'll notice this difference because it will be a lot lighter. The stainless steel iPhone Pros have been quite a lot heavier than the aluminum regular models. So I think we'll kind of appreciate this when it's in our pocket. The edges around the screen are a little bit smaller. We probably won't notice in day-to-day -day use, but effectively it means a slightly larger screen. But the bigger change is the action button. So Apple has held on to the mute switch for a long time. And I like the physical switches a lot on phones as they've gone away when we lost the home button. You know, I, I kind of miss those. I like being able to feel the interactions on my device. But I think this will be a very positive change because you can assign that action button to kind of whatever you want, including shortcuts. So it can like run a series of events and do a lot just from one button press. But I'm excited about it for photography because on Android phones, there's been ways to quick launch your camera app for a long time now. 
Best example I can think of is when we're skiing, I can double tap the power button, even with thick gloves, and launch the camera. So I am very excited to be assigning this to my favorite camera app. Maybe it'll be launching Halide every time, but it will definitely be a big change to how I use the iPhone as a camera. It looks like it'll be a big year for the processor. The A17 Pro has made the move to three nanometers, so we're probably gonna see some pretty significant gains. And for video processing, we're seeing some dedicated engines, including ProRes and AV1 decoding. On the Mac, we've seen huge speed gains with the way that the media engine works there, so I'm expecting good things on the iPhone as well. Circling back to USB-C, it's on the Pro that we're gonna see huge advantages, 20 times faster performance, 10 gigabits per second. Again, I wish this had been on all the phones, and I also wish it had been a little bit faster. These could have been Thunderbolt ports. I guess that gives us something to look forward to next year. It looks like there'll be some massive updates to the GPU, like they've added hardware ray tracing, and this isn't necessarily a photo or video thing, but it looks great for games, and they're actually releasing Assassin's Creed Mirage, which I pre-ordered for the PS5, and now I kind of want to play it on the iPhone just out of curiosity. It's hard to imagine a proper full console game running well on the phone, so we'll see. This sounds great. It looks like that 48 megapixel camera is pretty much the same. They've added an anti-reflective coating. I really hope this finally helps with some of the little orbs that you see when there is a backlight, especially in night shots. Same thing on the ultra wide and the 3X telephoto, pretty much the same sensors, but with that extra coating. So we'll see if it makes a difference. Right out of the gate, they mentioned seven focal lengths and that is quite misleading because it is just cropping in. And I saw people responding as if there really are seven focal lengths. There's not, it's just cropping into the sensor in a variety of ways that might be handy for your workflow. So I think people will use this and the image quality will be good, but it is not the same is seven focal lengths. It is a variety of crops. Apple can now natively support 48 megapixel HEAF files, which you had to use a third-party app to do that on the iPhone 14 Pro. And it's also gonna be exporting the same 24 megapixel files, which again, I hope look amazing, but I wanna see them up close. A little difference they don't emphasize between the Pro and the regular models is also that they're using the second gen OIS, the image stabilization, which works so well. Like I absolutely love that feature on the 14 Pro and you're not gonna get that on the regular 15. It's on the 15 Pro and I mean, it's just so exceptional. And most of the time you don't end up needing action mode because the default stabilization is so good. They mentioned two times better low light performance in portrait mode. I'm not sure exactly what two times the performance means, but it brought us to that slide that I liked so much. Hopefully that HDR looks as good as I think. Now, both of the Pro models have three lenses, but there's a significant difference with the Pro Max this year. It has a five times telephoto lens, which is very far. It's using a series of prisms built into the body in a way that you're not gonna see a perceivable difference, it basically keeps the size of the lens the same while reaching a lot further. So it means that if you want all the latest and greatest, you have to go for the Pro Max. And so I think this year I have to go for the Pro Max because there are some extra features here that are absolutely worth it to me. I'd like to try that extra reach, see what it's like to be able to zoom in up to an equivalent of 120 millimeters on full frame. That is really far, but I'm a little bit worried about the image quality. I think it's gonna look basically the same as we had on the 3X lens, which is a little over sharpened and just not as good as the main camera. I would rather see a larger sensor that just looks better than being able to zoom in further. That would be a more important upgrade to me. Something that I love they're able to do with USB-C now is support proper tethering, meaning that you can run Capture One, the professional standard in tethering photography software that we use in the studio. You can plug a USB-C cable into your phone and just run it like a real camera shooting RAW files that immediately transfer over to your computer. I think this will actually get used. I mean, it's not gonna be replacing big cameras, but there is definitely a use case where you'll wanna shoot directly into a computer. I mean, I'd probably use the RAW files more often that way. I don't shoot RAW that much on my phone because I don't wanna fill up the storage, but I could see certain cases where you're going straight to a computer. This is really interesting and might change some workflows. And the most exciting features to me, which they really glossed over quickly right towards the end is a little bundle of features for professional filmmakers that we will all appreciate. And I don't know if everybody out there will even understand what they are. First, let's look at the results we can get out of this. Apple released a new shot on iPhone music video that looks amazing. I mean, it looks like a 
completely professional video shot on a larger camera. There is some behind the scenes as well, so we can break down some of the details. But just like look at the images here, right? You, you're not thinking iPhone when you see this. Recently, I was watching The Bear, a TV show that is absolutely beautiful and I love it. And I spotted three frames in the middle of it that were clearly iPhone shots. Like they stood out because they were a little over sharpened and the contrast was different iPhone footage looks amazing, but clearly different from professional video. The features Apple's showing off in this music video is you can now shoot to an external drive. So there's this little USB-C drive you can see plugged in in all of the shots. That means you can just shoot so much more, like buy a drive just for a video project and load it up. And you can do that shooting on ProRes, which they added previously, but now also supports up to 60 frames per second. And that external drive makes it much more useful because you don't have to store it all inside of the phone. And even more exciting, the video now supports a log color profile, which that's the flat footage that has no contrast you see sometimes. Well, it's not supposed to look flat like that. It's a starting point that gives you a lot of flexibility when professionals are coloring their files later. And that's why it can match up to other bigger, more professional cameras. It supports ACES, which is a color standard that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences developed. Because we know exactly what that log profile looks like, it's gonna be pretty easy to match this to other cameras. This might be a huge deal in being able to have video from the iPhone really sync up with anything else that you're shooting. It still won't be the same image quality as a RED, but it will fit into those movies a lot better. So if you don't know how to work with log footage right now, I should really make some LUTs to make it easy. You'll just like drag and drop it on there and everything will look like a movie. Now that we know everything about the next iPhone, let's talk about the case that you're gonna to use to protect it. And I think the best options all come from Casetify, both in terms of being the most protective and most stylish and most customizable. First, you'll choose your level of protection. So the impact case is four times military grade. If you go to the ultra bounce, it is 10 times. Now, I didn't know what military grade was either, but it's an actual specification. And so for the test, we wanna drop it from about four feet, which I think is here. All right, and to see the results, we have to take our crash test iPhone out and it's completely fine. There's no damage. I've done this test many times with real iPhones in the past, so you can check out all my previous reviews for those. Down down. Three, two, one. But that was just military grade. So think about that this could drop 100 more times and the ultra bounce case is still gonna keep your iPhone protected. But we don't usually drop our phones 100 times in the row. It's also rated to be dropped from up to 32.8 feet. Depending which case you choose, you're gonna to wanna to add a few different accessories for full 360 coverage, like the screen protector. Make sure that you never get a scratch or crack on your iPhone screen. And then the lens protector, if your case leaves them exposed, you're gonna to wanna to add one on top or the ultra bounce case has them built in. So they are always protected no matter what. If you decide to invest in an iPhone, I think you should also get a case that is going to protect it. So check out the ultra bounce case, bounce case, ultra impact, or the impact case from Case Defy. Any of them can hold up to everything that you and life can throw at it. Now is the time to go and choose your next iPhone case. Head to the link below. It's gonna get you 15% off your order. And thanks again to Case Defy for sponsoring this video. And the last minute, a big surprise to me, spatial video is able to be captured on the iPhone 15 Pro. I knew this would come eventually, I just didn't think it would be this year. I thought we'd have to wait a little while, get Vision Pro in people's hands, but the two lenses uh, will apparently shoot stereo image and you'll get that 3D spatial effect when you review it back on the Vision Pro. This is really amazing how quickly they've moved with this. I don't know how good it's gonna look because typically you need further stereo separation between those lenses. I think that's why I thought it would take longer. Maybe they would have to move one lens to each side of the camera because it should be the same distance as your eyes apart. So we'll see what Apple can do with that smaller gap between the two lenses of the iPhone. There's gonna be a lot to test when I get my hands on this phone. Pre-orders open up Friday. It's gonna be shipping September 22nd. Prices are in the same range as last year. So hit subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video.